Hey, welcome everybody to Two Gig Tech Talk. I'm Scott. And I'm Jerome. And we're going to talk a little bit about this infamous takeover module. We're going to talk about how to program this puppy. All right, Jerome, why don't you kick it off here? We're going to talk about programming it into the edge panel. So what's the first thing we got to do? So the, uh, the first thing I want to kind of hit on is the, the importance of knowing how to program the, the takeover module, right? So the big thing that you have, we're, you're going to take away from this is that um, programming it is just like programming eight individual sensors. Um, and that is a huge part of the takeover module. And then once you understand that procedure of it, it's going to make programming and functioning and making the pro takeover module work that much better. Um, see, but the first thing that you're going to have to know is uh, in programming is actually the equipment code. The equipment code is probably one of the most important parts of um, the takeover module itself. And that's just making sure that the system knows what it's working with. And of course, with the new E-series sensors, you have to make sure there's a difference between non-E-series and E-series uh, variants of the takeover module. Because if you choose one and it's the other, it's gonna not work. So you have to make sure if it's an E-series takeover module, you choose E-series. If it's non-E-series, choose non-E-series in the equipment code option there. Right. Yep, that didn't used to be a very important step, but uh, it has become important as we've added uh, the E-series with our systems now, hasn't it, really? Absolutely. Uh, and then and then you're going to go in and program the sensor type after that. So the sensor type, really, uh, you know, it's just how do you want it to alarm? And that's going to be normal, too. You're going to be uh, pretty simplistic, just like your uh, whatever contact it is, generally a door or window that you're programming uh, that's uh, already wired up. Uh, you're just going to use your exit entry one or two and then your perimeter most most lot generally. No, absolutely. Um, there are a few ones that I want to like make sure we cover here on this side of things is uh, sensor types. You, you can't connect smokes or COs or any life safety devices to this panel. Uh, There'll be options there to choose them. They just won't work. Um, so keep yeah. that in mind. Yeah, it's not rated. It's not rated to be able to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> so then we go into TXID. Absolutely. Okay. Explain. Explain this one. Uh, oh, me. this is going to be my fun one. Um, so on that takeover module itself, if you look a little closer, you'll see a little white sticker. That little white sticker is going to actually have the TXID number on it, right? That TXID number always ends with a one. So whatever TXID number you're working with, so this one we have in front of you is 017-9581, right? So for the first sensor that is connected to that one terminal on there, that number one terminal, the one that is right next to 12 volts, that number one is gonna be that TXID number. Yep. So what happens then when I connect what's into number two, port Abs two? Absolutely. It's the same exact number, except you get rid of the one and you replace it with the two. Oh, okay. So I just go sequentially there. So my last one is going to be 0179588 for the, for this sensor, correct. correct? Yeah. And then the big thing, and a lot of things people get stuck on is you get that with that first one, then maybe you have a second one. And you think it's the same process, so you do 0179589, that's not correct. The new takeover module itself is going to have its own little white sticker with its own new number, and you're just going to replace that number when you're doing that process. So it'll start with the number one again, and so that takeover module will have its own number one, and then you'll go to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight again. Okay, so yeah, so essentially I should never, when using the pro programming this thing, I should never have a number that ends in a nine or a zero or anything like that uh, for, for programming these things. Correct? Absolutely. If you're like me, though, and you're kind of lazy, you can actually just go and hit the learn button in the panel and then open and close that contact, the front door, back door, motion detector, all of that fun stuff. And then it will auto learn the correct number in there as well. Yep. Just don't walk by a, a motion or something like that in your path when you're yeah. doing all the Do my favorite things. option, which is just get your towel you clean the, the panel with and stuff like that. 
your microfiber and throw it over the motion when you first get there so you don't accidentally set the motion off when you your your contacts. All right, here's another one, sensor loop. Now, I'm going to I'm going to change that then or uh is that change with every single zone as well? Nope, oh. that that one is a little bit weird as well because <laughs> The the all of the rest of our contacts, if you have multiple functions in that contact, you'll change the loop based on that contact. This one's weird because it's like having eight individual contacts. So each one of them are gonna be listed as loop one for all of them across right. the yep. board. I get that sometimes in the trainings. I'll say, okay, what loop numbers? And and they'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm like, no, the loop numbers don't go that way. <laughs> Absolutely, they only change to one because it only does one thing. It does one. It has one function, and that is to change that wired contact signal into a wireless signal to go to the panels. Yeah, even though it does it eight times, it's still doing one function. You just wire each of them into a separate port which then sends a serial number that's different or a txid right. number and then, and then voice descriptor i usually just punch in you know what it is right you just start yep. saying uh you just start labeling that zone of uh, that's such and such window such and such door etc and there you go absolutely uh what about sensor chime you do anything for that uh yeah so it depends on the person so you talk to the customer see how the customer feels about it if they don't want to chime don't choose a chime. If they want to yeah. chime, enable the chime. We have a bunch of options there for all your chimes. Um, you can do voice only. You can do chime. You can do chime with voice. And you get a bunch of options there. If the customer in about a week hates it, don't worry. Right. They can turn it off and they can do all that stuff without you even being there. So just choose what you want or what the customer wants and allow that to go through. Because after about a week, their kids are going to be ringing the front door front door, front door, front door, and they're going to want to kill somebody. So the easy way to fix that is to just give them the option to turn it on and off. Um, yeah. That's what we've done. Just make sure they know, make sure they know where that's at, you know, point it out to them. Uh, and then for smart area assignment, usually uh, I'm, I'm not doing a lot of partitioning really on, on these, but uh, if you wanted to, you could change it. But for the most part, a lot of the times this is, or I'm not partitioning any of this out. So it'll just be a, a, just leave it on smart area one, correct? Yep. Um, and if you do want to partition, that's perfectly fine. Just choose which partition you want each contact to go to. Um, yep. And it's pretty straightforward that way. Yep. And then transmission delay. How do you explain that one for us? So the easiest way to say it is uh, most people think that when their alarm goes off, their alarm is immediately going off and it's sending that signal to central station. What transmission delay does is when that sick when your alarm goes off, it gives you an extra 30 seconds before we send the signals out to the central station to disarm the alarm. Now, you can put that on every single one of your contacts, or you can only put it on the front door and back door, and then you then it's only when someone comes into the house through an entry exit, not perimeter. That's my recommendation so that your house is a little bit more secure. But it is yep. there for compliance um, to make sure that we don't send the police out to things that aren't necessary. But, and I make this a big but, because the issue you run into with this is if you don't tell the customer, they think their system is broken. Because I disarmed my alarm, but no one called me to verify it was me. So they don't know the system's actually working when... Yeah. That doesn't set off the alarm or the right. You gotta make sure they're well informed. Make sure the customer is well informed. Make sure they they know exactly how this is gonna function. And I and I agree really. Right, Windows, you probably don't need to be having a transmission delay. Uh, you know, I, and unless you know, if you talk to the customer, do you know when you arm the system? Do the kids forget that the system's armed and they open a window? Do you need time to to uh, disarm that and to make sure that? Uh, you're not getting charged for false alarms uh, when the kid, when the children are open up windows. That may come into play, but generally, a lot of times, you know, they're turning that kind of thing off. And that depends on the area too, really. Maybe some places get charged a lot of money for false alarms. Some don't some at all. Don't really get charged hardly anything at or all. Or they just stop responding. Is what another one. So a lot of places go, hey, we're not going to charge you anything. We're just not going to come to your alarm anymore. Yeah, um, so which that's is bad. Kind of 
Yep. Sensor reports, uh, Jerome, I've never really gotten a good reason why I would waste my time installing a sensor and then not have it at least on alarm.com to report to alarm.com because even if I'm just using it as a trigger for uh, so like an automation or something like that, I still need it on alarm.com in order to be able to do that, you know? So, uh, so a few, usually I, I actually just leave it alone. I got one and it's, it's a weird one because it was a, uh, retirement home or a, uh, um, elderly care facility with people with, uh, conditions where they would get lost very easily. So Alzheimer's, um, and what they would do is they put contacts on the interior to exterior doors and they didn't want the cops called. They just wanted a loud noise to make sure that the nurses at the nurse station knew that there's someone got out and that's what they use it for. Um, okay. But in 99.9% .9 of the rest of the cases, you want to make sure that um, the is reporting, reporting is on, right? Because you don't want the someone to open the front door after the alarm's gone off thinking it's not going to set the alarm off because it will send the signal at that point. And the last thing we're programming is sensor supervision. So what's that all about? So what this says is, Hey, I want to make sure that, um, my, so that I think your, your stories is probably the, the, the best on this one. So I'm going to okay. use it. So what it is, right. is, is imagine the panel is the, uh, um, annoying boyfriend or girlfriend that always checks in every hour. Hey, where you at? Hey, how's work? Hey, how you doing? Hey, hey. Right? And so what it does is it checks with those contacts to make sure they're communicating. Right? And it requires a signal back saying, hey, I'm still here. If it misses seven of them, it goes, hey, someone's missing. Someone's not answering my phone call. Right? And once it does that, that's when you get a loss of supervision. And that happens if a contact doesn't communicate seven times in a row. Five for life safety, seven for um, non-life safety. But we're not doing life safety on this one, right? Correct. You cannot do life safety on this one. So it's going to be seven checks to verify that information. Um, yep. And it's just there to make sure that it's not leaving with the Honeywell sensor. <laughs> right. Not going out behind its back, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so that's really the supervision. There are a few sensors that I recommend you don't use it on, but... The takeover module is never going to use those type of contacts. So you don't have to worry about those. All right. Yeah, well, I think that really sums it up. You know, we went over today, we talked about the uh, takeover module, and we really went into pretty detail about exactly how to program it, make sure that we understand that we're programming the correct equipment code, the sensor, um, the TXID is the another important one, and making sure that we're leaving that uh, sensor loop at one. Uh, and that'd be about all we really have time for today. Thanks, Jerome. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So I, uh, if um, you're interested in watching more, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Take care.